I'm very pleased to be chairing this session. My name is Jenny Bristow. I um, am editor of, just a little plug, Abortion Review, um, a publication produced by British Pregnancy Advisory Service. There's some copies on the front if you want to take a look, which looks at a combination of clinical and ethical issues to do with abortion provision, the law, and um, services and all the debates around it. So I'm absolutely delighted to be um, chairing a debate that, that very much brings these issues together. I'd like to thank uh, BPAS, British Pregnancy Advisory Service, for sponsoring this session along with the Wellcome Trust. It's been quite serendipitous that this session was obviously organised by Sandy Starr months and months ago, before we were kind of done a huge topical favour, if you like, by the Women's Min Minister, Maria Miller, and then the Health Secretary, Jeremy Hunt, for making some comments on uh, what they felt about the abortion and the abortion time limit, um, the latest point at which people should be allowed to have abortions, uh, which they did fairly recently. And it was quite interesting because both these politicians um, you know, aired their opinions on the subject with reference to the science. You know, they said, I believe that the limit should be 20 weeks or 12 weeks because this is what the science kind of suggests. And that really gets to the, the heart of the issue that we're going to be discussing today, which is what balance does scientific evidence give in making uh, what we might think of as moral and ethical decisions around abortion? And how do we weigh up this, this uh, balance between you know, what is a moral choice and what is a, a medical procedure and a, um, a medical choice? I should say, by the way, I think both sides of the abortion debate are equally guilty, if you like, of a certain over-reliance on scientific evidence as a way of making the arguments. And so I'm not, um, even though I am obviously partisan on the question of abortion rights, in relation to this particular debate, I think it's more of a question of how both sides tend to use the, use the science and how do we feel about that. Anyway, that's enough from me. I would like to introduce our panel of speakers. We're going to start with Anne Faraday, Chief Executive of the British Pregnancy Advisory Service. She will be followed by Peter D. Williams, um, Executive Officer of Right to Life, um, who is also a political lobbyist working with the all-party parliamentary pro-life group. Peter will be followed by Dr. Sarah Chan, who is Deputy Director of the Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovation at the University of Manchester, and uh, researches bioethics and law. And finally, we have uh, Stephen Edwards, who's Professor of Philosophy of Healthcare at Swansea University. Right, Anne. Well, I'm really glad to be here. I actually wasn't at the conference yesterday, although I would have liked to have been here then too, because... <laughs> I was speaking to um, a conference of about 500 people who work in abortion services in Edinburgh, and the conference uh, was called Unwanted Pregnancy, A Fact of Life, and I'd been asked to open the conference by doing a plenary talk on the moral case for abortion. After I'd given that talk, um, I was handed a letter by one of the stewards that had been given to me by one of the protesters outside because there'd been a little row of right-to-life protesters outside. And the letter says, Dear Anfaradian friends, there is no moral case for abortion. Abortion, as you well know, is killing of unborn children. The truth is the truth, even if no one believes it. Please rethink the whole thing through. So I've rethought the whole thing through, and what I want to do at this panel today is to re-argue why I think there's a moral case for abortion, pretty much the same as I did at this meeting of doctors yesterday, because I do think that there is. I think that over the last um, decade or so, I think that the pro-choice lobby, which I would see myself very much part of, has made a very good pragmatic case for abortion services. I think that we've become pretty good at arguing that abortion is a fundamental reproductive health care need and that the absence of safe abortion um, does create an increase in maternal mortality because women will try to control their fertility and to prevent themselves from having babies that they have conceived 
by um, trying to access unsafe services when safe services are not available. So I think that abortion is an important part of women's re reproductive health care needs. I think it's essential uh, in a modern society if we believe in equal opportunity and equality between women and men because I think that unless we are able to control uh, uh, fertility, it's impossible for women to play a full part in social life. We can't control our fertility by the means of contraception alone, and so we need abortion as a backup to contraception if we're to control the timing and spacings of our, our children. I think we've made a good case that it's not possible to prevent abortion simply by better access to sex education and better access to contraceptive services. I can say hand on heart that the women that we see in BPAS clinics are perfectly clear about how babies are made. They don't have a gap in the knowledge of their sex education. And they're also generally pretty clear about how to get access to contraception. Indeed, about half of the women that we see will have been using contraception at the time that they conceived, or that's what they say they've been doing. And we know that contraception fails. Often contraception fails, sometimes we fail to use it effectively. And we know that abortion, even if it is outlawed, it cannot be banned, it cannot be eliminated. Ireland is a country where abortion is very clearly against the law and women still resort to abortion by travelling to England or by buying drugs off the internet. So you can ban abortion, but you can't prevent it. So the argument that the pro-choice uh, side have generally put is that pragmatically, even if you don't like the idea of abortion, Peter, you can't really prevent it. It's sort of a fact of life. And we support our claim by lots of discussion about science, about uh, to explain uh, the fact that the fetus in the womb is not the same as the baby outside the womb, that it can't feel pain, that it's not conscious, that it doesn't have experience. And we also talk a lot about the epidemiology of abortion and demography, and we talk about the fact that abortion involves generally the destruction of a very early embryo and not the destruction of the fetus or the late fetus, the unborn baby that is often shown in the pictures of the protesters that are outside of our clinics. And I think that we rely on science a lot and epidemiology to, to tell us that. But I have to say, I think it's those arguments, while I think that we've made a very good case in public health for arguing for legal ab abortion services, I think it's been a very defensive case. I think that we have to realise that it's defensive in the sense that abortion is not something that any woman ever aspires to. No woman ever wants to have an abortion. And a woman does not exercise her right to abortion in, for example, the way that a woman exercises her right to vote. You know, you have an abortion because you need one, not because you want one. And it is quite difficult to be really enthusiastic about that, actually, that women are accessing a service because they fail to prevent their pregnancy. And I was talking with one of my board members recently, who happens to be a board member who runs both abortion services and infertility clinics, <laughs> And we were talking about why particularly younger people these days tended to be sometimes quite against the idea of abortion. And he made the point to me, which I think is absolutely true, because it's very, it's very difficult to get young people to be uh, enthusiastic about the idea of killing the unborn baby in the womb. And I think that's true. So I want to make a point that uh, there's not only a pragmatic case, but there's a moral case. And I'd like to quote uh, Blaise Pascal, who was a mathematician and a philosopher, who made the point that we know the truth. And I think I know the truth about abortion, not just by reason, but also by the heart. And that uh, I regard abortion as being a fundamental moral issue, as well as a medical need. I think abortion is a moral issue in the sense that what we really mean by moral, when we talk about moral, we talk about those ideas and values that hold society together. Morals are the kind of cement that make human society 
what it is. And that abortion is a moral issue for the conservative establishment because it challenges the existence of abortion and access to abortion. The idea of freedom of choice challenges uh, a lot of conservative values about sex. It challenges a lot of conservative values about sexual freedom, what women's role is, what the family should be. And fundamentally, it challenges society's notions about women's decision-making capacities. Because when we say that women should have the freedom of reproductive choice, that suggests that women as individuals can be trusted to act in a responsible manner on the basis of their own beliefs and conscience and that we should be trusted to make our own decisions. And for me, abortion is a moral issue and I believe that restricting women's right to decide is an affront to my morals. And I'll finish on this point. It's an affront to my morals because my morals are based on a belief in respect for human life and part of, I believe, what is human life is our humanness in being able to make decisions and shape the way that we are. It's not just a biological life. It's about the kind of sense of what it takes us to be human and our own judgment and our ability to make decisions is part of that. Part of my morality is an intense respect for personal autonomy. It's the sense that we should have the ability to make decisions. It's about tolerance of freedom of expression and tolerance to allow people to make decisions even when you think that they are the wrong decisions. And it's about a belief in people's inviolability of our bodily integrity, that I am not just a means to achieve something else, that I have rights in and of myself. And that's my moral basis for freedom of choice. I think it's morally reprehensible to deny women the capacity to make their choice and to take away from them a decision which is deeply intimate because, it's, uh, because they are closest to the consequences. I think when I look at the kind of moral future that I want for the next generation, I see it as being a future that has true equality of of equality of opportunity and one where individuals have the freedom to make those personal choices. So freedom of choice for me is more than simply a right, it is right in and of itself and that to me is a deeply moral and ethical issue. Okay, thank you Anne. Right, Peter, you next. I didn't realise there was going to be a debate about abortion per se but about a very specific element of abortion so I haven't uh, brought along a case for the right to life per se, but I'm happy to give it if you ask me the question, because I've brought a case which is much more specific than that. I'll just begin by uh, pointing out uh, to Anne, um, the protesters were not right-to-life protesters. They might have been pro-life, but they weren't of my organisation, okay. first off. Uh, maternal mortality, I'm happy to answer, given that uh, you know, Ireland has one of the lowest maternal mortality rates in the world. Poland and El Salvador, when they made abortion illegal, had great declines in maternal mortality rates, if you compare countries like Sri Lanka to Nepal, Sri Lanka having a very, one of the most restrictive abortion laws on the planet compared to Nepal, one of the most liberal, has lower maternal mortality rates. Happy to I have that argument. But I'm going to save the rest of my remarks uh, regarding other subjects that we'll be discussing till later. Um, I want to have this discussion really on the very specific subject of medical and moral choice. And I think we can see, if we look at the context of the legal and social reality in which we exist, that abortion is both those things. Um, I was surprised um, that we have this false dichotomy between medical and moral in the title of our debate, and I think it's worth pointing that out. Legally in the UK, abortion is a medical choice. Um, the word choice seems odd here, as it does suggest a free and more autonomous decision, but insofar as the law allows for a choice to have an abortion according to the 1967 Abortion Act, this is one determined by what can be described as medical factors. Um, the continuance of the pregnancy would involve risk greater than if the pregnancy were terminated of injury to the physical and mental health of the pregnant woman or her existing uh, children or family, uh, necessary to prevent grave permanent injury to the physical and mental health of the pregnant woman, that it would involve risk to the life of the pregnant woman, or that there is substantial risk that if the child were born, she would suffer from such physical and mental abnormalities as to be seriously handicapped. But being a medical choice, however, it is also moral. Um, of course, most, if not all, human decisions are moral on some level. Uh, many may be morally trivial, but there includes at least some moral dimension in most of our choices. Medical decisions, meanwhile, are often morally grave, um, as they involve the intervention in the physical health of another human being, 
often in very serious ways. This is why medical ethics, bioethics, exist. In the case of abortion, intervention is being made in the health and indeed the life of two human beings, the mother and her unborn child. And this has what should be an obvious moral gravity. Indeed, the law does recognise to some extent that the zygotal, marulan, blastocystic, embryonic or fetal human being has some kind of moral status, more than, say, an appendix or a skin cell. The reason why we have, at least for now, maybe not for much longer, um, the HFE authority is precisely, or ostensibly, to grant use of embryos when it is strictly necessary for medical science because even the human being at those earliest days-old stages is thought to have a moral status. Be all this as it may, the law does not affirm consistently the right to life of every human being, and it certainly does not affirm, affirm the right to choice to abort unborn human being based on purely personal moral factors. The legal situation we have now neither reflects what Anne or I would want it to be. This does not make the law a compromise, however, it seems to um, say in the blurb, which would suggest that the politicians representing our mutually opposed viewpoints came together and hashed together a middle way position. On the contrary, mostly, they did not. The law as we have it is, as, um, as I've pointed out, very strict in its letter in terms of when it allows abortions to occur. And the so-called principle of viability, which we neither of us accept as a good principle for deciding an upper limit for abortion, is simply a hangover from the Infant Life Preservation Act in terms of how it was that the felony of abortion could legally be discerned from the new felony that was created at the time in 1929 of child destruction. So this, however, that's the political situation. That's the legal reality. The social situation the law has engendered is, however, a kind of compromise between law and practice. And insofar as we have abortion on demand de facto, though not de jure, I do think it behoves us to think of some of the contemporary issues of debate that have flared up in the light of abortion being a moral choice. I think it was a mistake last year for um, certain uh, pro-life politicians, or one particular politician who will remain nameless, um, to attack the provision by BPAS and MSI of pre-abortion counselling on the basis that they may have a material or ideological interest in providing abortions. Um, both present themselves as charities, and I, for one, take Anne's word for it uh, when she says that that's the, the point of their organisations. Rather than excluding some organisation's provision of such counselling, surely we should be trying to ensure that every woman should have as much choice as she can as to what provider she wants for her pre-abortion counselling. Yes, that would include organisations like BPAS and MSI, but it should also include groups like Life or Care Confidential or the Right to Life Charitable Trust. This means treating women with moral seriousness. It seems to me some people, um, particularly on sort of the more guardian reading uh, so-called liberal uh, pro-choice left, want to treat women as if they're a bit stupid. I certainly don't. It seems to me that women know, obviously, the ideological background organisations like Life, or indeed possibly BPAS have, and if they choose such an organisation, they accept and maybe even desire that. Life, as it happens, uses non-directional counselling and the belief that women naturally will tend away from abortion, and thus all that the pro-lifer needs is to put her in touch with her own natural feelings, which is what natural, uh, non-directive um, counselling is basically about. So why not? What are we afraid of? Let women have that choice. Similarly, with the issue of abortion protesting that has just come up, I'm using these issues because they have come up very recently. Um, I've expressed my profound opposition um, in the past few weeks and before to certain forms of abortion protesting, like Abort 67, and I've drawn flack because of it from my own side. And I'm very happy to do that, because I believe those uh, forms of protest are damaging, unhelpful, and unprogressive. However, with 40 Days for Lifestyle vigils, which, whatever you think of the wisdom of such events, try to offer women a last-minute alternative viewpoint, an option to the choice to have an abortion, surely, on a moral and political level, you should at least believe this is allowable. If you think women aren't strong enough to take an alternative take on a choice that they've decided to make and feel it is either wrong or should be illegal, as some have argued, um, to present women with that alternative, I don't really think you respect women's autonomous ability to make moral choices. Some people want to call abortion a, moral, a personal moral choice, and they, but they apparently cling to a closed paternalistic medical approach to the issue when it comes to what women are allowed to consider when they approach that choice. Surely, however, if you believe, really believe, that abortion is a purely personal moral choice and in the autonomy of women to make that choice, then you should have the confidence in them to decide what voices they will listen to and what they will not, and to allow them access to the variety of voices that exist talking about this moral choice. And not merely in the legislative chamber, not the academy, or even the debating chamber, but in all the contexts that pertain to this subject. Only when you do that, in my opinion, will you treat this seriously as a moral choice rather than a purely medical one. Thank you, Peter. Sarah. So, as has been pointed out, the way this session is framed is in terms of looking at abortion as a medical or a moral choice. 
My position on the moral issues is quite simple, and I'm going to lay it out quickly for you, and then perhaps that's something we, we might engage around later on. But just to get it um, out, out of the way and on, on the table, the key, the, there are two key issues in terms of deciding abortion purely as a moral issue. The first clearly concerns the moral status <coughs> of the embryo or fetus, the, the life before birth. And the question is whether it's morally wrong to end the life of an embryo or fetus, whether an embryo is the kind of being, or whether a fetus is the kind of being that can be morally wronged by this. And I'm going to say that given what we value, what we think is morally important about us as beings and the kinds of properties and the kinds of things that we value about ourselves as morally important beings, I think the human embryo, the human fetus, is important in many ways, but it is not in itself the kind of being that can be wronged by having its life ended before birth. The second issue, however, and the one that I think is actually far more important in this debate, is <coughs> the rights of women. So not, not the rights of life before birth, but the, the rights of women who are in a position where they may need to make choices about their future, about their fertility, and about what happens to their bodies. And even though the question over the moral status of human life before birth may be one on which we never agree, I think we can still say that a woman's right to have a say over what happens to her body, to have autonomy, as, as Anne pointed out, in her choices, and to say whether or not, for example, she wishes to have children at a particular time, whether, whether that's something that guides her life in the direction that she chooses that should actually be her, be her own choice. And so I think the, the woman's right to bodily integrity is actually far more what's at stake here. So those are, that's my opinion on the purely moral issues. But as we know, decisions about abortion don't take place in a, in a vacuum. They are not purely moral choices. They take place in the real world. They affect people's lives. They are a matter partly of policy, and they involve doctors as well. And this is where I want to raise two issues about abortion that I think actually should have far more place in the debate that we're having than the purely moral. The first of these is to do with how we, how we make abortion available, how women are able to access abortion. And the second of these is to do with how we talk about abortion in these debates that we're having. I'm going to disagree with Peter here and say that I don't think the medical versus moral is necessarily a false dichotomy, in fact, because, as has been so clearly explained, the way in which women are able to access abortion, even if it is, as you call it, abortion on demand, and I would say that's still far from being the case, but even if we're in a situation where abortion is readily available through medical channels, the fact is that it's still, if not exclusively, a medical decision, one that finally rests in the hands of the doctors as to what, what the woman is allowed to do. So in other words, it's a decision about which the final choice is not in the hands of the person to whom it matters most, the person who will be most affected, but in the hands of healthcare providers. I think the consequences of that really need to be carefully considered. I think we are risking medicalising something unnecessarily. We, it means that classifications about what's considered medical and a healthcare decision are taken out of the realms of choices about one's own life and instead framed as healthcare choices. And I think that has, that has ramifications for how we consider these. The second issue that I want us to talk about, though, is how we discuss, how we discuss abortion, the kind of language that we use when, when we have these, these debates. And I think to talk about abortion in terms like saying abortion on demand or, as is often raised in, in the case of um, people presenting for repeat abortion, to talk about women who use abortion as an alternative form of contraception, the implication, I suppose, being that what these women are too lazy or too irresponsible to actually use contraception, so they'll go and have an abortion instead. And, I mean, this is moral blaming and shaming of, of the worst sort. It is passing judgment on women who are already facing a difficult situation. The sort of language we use to say abortion on demand really trivialises the <coughs> procedure and the decision decision. As Anne said, no woman ever wants to have an abortion. You would have one because you need one, not because you want one. So abortion is not a decision that should be or that is ever taken lightly, precisely because it is so controversial. Even if you might, yourself might hold a clear moral position about how to proceed, making that decision in the social context and having to go through the healthcare system to do that 
means that it's never, never a simple, never an easy decision. Talking about abortion on demand, I mean, that sounds like, what's that TV channel for on demand? It makes it sound like abortion is something like going down the street to buy a, a new handbag. And it, of course, it's nothing like that. So I think to speak about abortion in such, such sort of um, trivial terms really disregards the kind of experience that, that women have to go through in making these hard decisions. It trivialises the issue and it trivialises the very real experience that people have with this. Women are already facing difficult decisions. Why make it any harder for them to do so by speaking about what must be a, a very, very, a very difficult decision for them to make in such dismissive terms? I think that's really what the kind of level on which we need to be talking. Thanks. Okay. Finally, uh, Stephen. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I just want to go back to one of the concepts that Sarah raised, i.e. the concept of moral status, and, and suggest that... Um, Insofar as science is relevant to the abortion issue, it's relevant insofar as it can give us uh, relevant scientific facts uh, about the, um, the embryo. So, for example, uh, if one thought that the moral status of a thing uh, um, is higher if it's capable of suffering or capable of feeling pain, then scientific research that showed that, for example, the embryo could feel pain at a certain stage would be relevant to uh, the assessment of the rightness or wrongness of um, abortion. Uh, just to expand a little bit on the idea of moral status, crudely, you know, if, if you kill an ant, uh, you, you, no one would say you'd, done, you'd committed uh, a wrong which is as great a wrong as ending the life of, of, a, of a person, as ending the life of any one of us in this room. And certainly there'd be no legal consequences to uh, ending the life of an ant, but there would be legal consequences to ending the life of um, uh, one of us in, any one of us in this room. So we, we work with a rough and ready hierarchy of uh, moral status with some creatures at the bottom, some creatures typically persons like us uh, at, at the top. Now if it's true that the law, uh, legal and moral norms reflect a view of moral status and we think about uh, the prevalence of abortion uh, in, in the UK, about 200,000 a year uh, before 24 weeks, it seems to follow that the fetus is ascribed a lower moral status than creatures beyond 24 weeks and certainly full, uh, fully developed human beings like us. So the question then arises, what is the basis for the difference in moral status before 24 weeks and, and after 24 weeks? So the, the focusing on moral status, I think, uh, brings to life the, an anomaly in current practice according to which uh, a being the same creature can be killed kind of before 24 weeks but cannot be killed afterwards. And one wants to know, well, you know, what is this, the, the, the basis for the difference in moral status ascribed to that same thing in such a, a short space of time? The problem, so that's a, an issue, uh, a difficulty for current practice prompted by further consideration of the concept of moral status. If one thinks about an extreme pro-life view according to which ending the life of the, um, the, the embryo uh, from day one is as great a wrong as ending the life of any one of us in this room. Again, one wants to pose the question, well, what could be the basis for ascribing full moral status to, a, to such a primitive creature, to a creature that can, can, uh, is nowhere near as sophisticated as uh, fully developed human beings? To talk about the, the, the pro-choice perspective, if the basis for the, um, uh, ascribing a lower moral status to the fetus is due to its location in the womb of the mother. And so the suggestion is that the rights over the woman's own body uh, weigh more than any rights to life of the uh, fetus. Well, it obviously follows that uh, termination should be permissible right the way through pregnancy, and not many people um, um, defend that. But also, uh, I mean, this is my view, but um, it's often raised against that, that, that line of argument that one's moral status shouldn't be dependent upon one's uh, location. So the mere fact that uh, the fetus is located in the womb shouldn't have any adverse implications for its moral status. So it, uh, I just really wanted to, I know Sarah mentioned the idea of moral status. I think it is an important uh, c concept, a relevant concept in this debate to help uh, make sense of the differing, differing positions and try to come up with um, a coherent and uh, ethically uh, justifiable resolution of this extremely difficult moral problem. I've got loads of questions, but um, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Um, before we go out to the audience, would any of you on the panel, because you cover so much ground, have you got any questions for each other or any challenges that you want to make just to get things um, going? 
Pizza, clearly. Um, <laughs> and why, on, when do you think the fetus has a moral status, or what moral status would you attribute to the fetus? And why is the, fetus, the moral status of a newborn baby different to that of a fetus? I do attribute a moral mm. status to the fetus. I, I, I actually attribute a moral fetus to the embryo. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there is something that is, um, that is incredibly special about a potential human being that is different from other forms of animal life or indeed is different from any other kind of, of, of biological life. And I actually think that most people do. I think that even people who are absolutely 100% pro-choice will say that there is something about ending a pregnancy, which I think is why women go into it very reluctantly. But for me, the moral status of the, of the embryo as a potential human being is considerably less important than the moral autonomy of a person in being able to make those decisions and make those moral choices. And when you say, I think it's a, it's a challenge to, to Stephen, really, that can the moral status of the fetus be dependent upon its location? Well, when it comes to pregnancy, I actually think that location is incredibly important because the point about it is that if we believe in in the in bodily integrity and autonomy of an individual, then it seems to me that it's impossible to give a being that is bodily dependent upon that any rights or status independent of that woman without in any way infringing it. And just to <coughs> kind of give, a, give a, a very short example of what I mean and why I think that society gets very confused about this issue, right? You would say, perhaps, that I have a moral responsibility not to abort my unborn child because of the status of what its life is and the fact that I may make a decision that I don't want to continue that pregnancy is, is less a moral decision than my belief in, than, than your belief in continuing the life of the unborn child. And I think that that's something which people will quite readily buy into. Yet at the same time, if anybody said that my, um, my young son was going to die if I didn't take the decision to give him a kidney, or if I didn't have a, uh, or if I didn't have a bone marrow transplant to keep him alive, you would nevertheless accept that there should be no law, I think, that would force me to have that kidney transplant to keep him alive, or to have that bone marrow transplant to keep him alive, even though he is another human being. So we accept my bodily integrity and autonomy when it comes to a form of surgery like that, even though me refusing to do it may result in the death of another living person. And yet at the same time, you have the audacity to assume that a person's bodily integrity and autonomy should be undermined to protect the life of the child when it's in the womb. Now, I I find that really morally inconsistent. And so when I say that I think, you know, it really is all about the person's ability to make their choice, it's because I think that in these morally contested areas, it should be down to the individual who will be most affected, who decides where the locus of that moral argument lies. Surely abortion isn't merely the withdrawal of support of another human being. It's the act of destruction of that being. If we were going to use Judith Jarvis Thompson's analogy of the, of the uh, violinist, I think abortion is not analogous to that. It's not merely you withdrawing support of the violinist. It's, it's the analogy would be better if you hacked him to death with a machete. That would be more, I think, an, a, a proper analogy with the situation. But look, this, the view that you take isn't human rights law. And I don't think it's a basic humanism either. Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights gives every human being, and I have to say the human being is every member of the human species. It's not merely, you can't have a potential human being. I mean, I suppose a sperm might be a potential human being and an egg might be a potential human being. But when conception happens, that is a human being. And therefore it is subject to your human rights. 
because um, Articles 2, 6, and 7 of that same declaration grant human rights to all human beings without discrimination on the basis of age, amongst many other things. Article 6 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child gives the rights of life to all children. And within the preface of that document, it says that children need protection before as well as after birth. So, in, and that, by the way, that's something for which we are signatory. The UK is signatory to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this fits in perfectly what, with what we know from biological science. I'll quote the embryologist William J. Larson. He says, we begin our description of the de developing human with the formation and differentiation of the male and female sex cells or gametes, which will unite at fertilization, conception, to initiate the embryonic development of a new individual. Okay, that's William J. Larson's Human Embryology, if you're interested. So yeah, the, the law in this country recognises, however imperfectly, the moral status of the embryo. International human rights law recognises this. And I think a basic humanism should give us this protection to all human beings. If you want to start saying, right, well, we're going to decide that a human being is a human person, that is, a human being that, can, that possesses human rights, at some point, you really need to give me the criteria of what is a human person. And if you're going to say, well, it's, it's consciousness, it's the ability to feel pain, well, all right, what about people who are in comas or persistent vegetative states? Can we do what we like with them? Let's have consistency on that front. Let's have consistency in treating adults, human beings, with the same, with, with the same consideration as pre-born human beings, if we're going to use that kind of criteria. Give me criteria that would apply to the unborn child, that you could say, to, to deny its moral status, that would not be then be able to be used for an adult who we already admit has a moral status that includes the basic right to life. So I, I think that the viewpoint that Anne takes, um, I, I totally understand it, and I totally see the power of it when it comes to a woman's moral autonomy. I think, however, it denies human rights, the, the, the human rights legislation that we have, and I think it's basically anti-humanistic. With respect, Peter, I think you might be trying to derive a moral ought from a legal is there. Um, what human rights law happens to say is a matter for law, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what we, what we ought to believe morally. Why should all human life be what is so special? You asked the question, mm -hmm. if we're going to accord rights to all human persons, or I think you put it the other way around, actually, to say that all human persons should have human rights. All human beings are. But I think human being and human person are coterminous. Well, I think I, I, um, perhaps Steve will have something to say on this. The term, although we tend to use the terms human and person interchangeably, this is largely because all of the persons that we currently know are probably humans, and most humans that we know happen to be persons. But in fact, philosophically speaking, the term person is usually used yeah. with a slightly different and more technical, um, a more technical meaning to mean those kinds of creatures to which we would accord a moral status such, they, that, such that they should have rights, such that they ought to um, that have their wishes respected, their lives respected and so forth. And I think uh, quite a, a number of philosophers would, um, would disagree that the limits of the category person should be equal and identical with the limits of the category human. I want to refer back to the comments that Anne made earlier about human life being a humanness that is more than just biological life. And in the same way, life is more than just mere survival or existence. When we talk about the meaning of life, we don't just mean the meaning of our biological processes con continuing to tick, our cells continuing to turn over. We mean a kind of idea of ourselves as an entity that has an existence, past, present and future, that we can have a kind of well-being or welfare that we care about, and that we, can, we have the ability to direct our own lives according to our idea of what the good life is, what we, what we want for ourselves. And so I think if by asking what is human or what is a person or what is a human person, you actually mean what kind of beings should we be respecting the lives of, I think unless you respect your own life, how can you expect others to respect it? Okay, thanks, Sarah. Uh, Stephen? Well, just very quickly, really. I think in my sort of brief um, uh, summary of the issue, as I saw it, I raised two challenges, one to pro-life view and one to the pro-choice view. The challenge to the pro-life view was... Why should we accord full moral status to a creature so primitive as a, a very, very early embryo? And the challenge to the pro-choice view was, why should the uh, rights to life of the uh, rights uh, of the mother over her own body count for more than the right to life of the fetus? If it's claimed that the rights to uh, the, the rights of the mother over her own body count for more, why don't they count for more right the way through pregnancy? And so we should uh, therefore permit. Uh, termination of pregnancy as long as the fetus is within the body of the mother, so well, well after 24 weeks, in other words. So I'm pointing to difficulties, to, as I see them anyway, for both sides from the mm -hmm. perspective of moral status. Yes, and then coming back to one of the um, 
the, the issues in this session is that the argument precisely about the difference between the 24-week fetus and the fetus after is often given on scientific or medical grounds. It's to do with notions of viability and, and all of that. But there is a big question about how far that can make the argument, really. Um, of the, also, scientists disagree. Anyway, that's one for the audience. OK, Anne. Well, you know, I, I agree with the logic of the argument that you're putting forward, is that if I'm going to argue that it's about women's autonomy and so on, then I have to basically not go, go into there is something special about 24 weeks. And I don't say there's anything special about 24 weeks. I think I would completely logically, consistently support that position right the way through. But on the humanity thing, you see, I think it's really interesting. I got vilified two years ago uh, when I was involved in a debate with someone from the, the Christian Medical Ethics or Organization where they challenged me on what I, I, I thought about the humanity and the, the personhood of the fetus. And I made the point, well, you know, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? It's obviously alive, it's not dead, and it's obviously human in the sense that it's not a gerbil. You know, it is alive and it's human, and, you know, it has a beating heart. So clearly, you know, there is a, a human life there in that sense. But I do think when we talk about human life, and we, we, with it, even without getting into semantic discussion about life, human life and human personhood, I think that there is something that is a little bit more that's underneath it. And I was particularly struck when I was... I, I, I came into a discussion in here this morning on organ donation, which I thought was really interesting in thinking about this in a way that I'd never thought about it before, because, of course, the Catholic Church and the Pope, apparently, thinks that organ donation is a really good thing. Right? It's something that is generally completely promoted. And yet, they can only accept organ donation from people who are clearly dead. Okay? But then, for the organ donation to be carried out, we were hearing this morning that there needed to be a beating heart. You know, the person needs to be kept alive, in a sense, on the machine, even though we know that they are dead. And yet, somehow, we're clearly seeing something about aliveness and not aliveness that is different from just that kind of biological pinkness, beating heart, capacity to breathe. And I think that's really what underlies all of my arguments, that when we talk about humanity and human personhood and what we respect, it, it's something more intrinsically about what it is to be human. And, and for me, choice is part of that, which is why I think it's so important. It's decision-making capacity, it's consciousness, it's all of that. I'm very interested in this question of moral status, because... I think it's worth actually drawing a distinction between things to which we ascribe moral status and things we don't treat in a certain way because it would dehumanize us. So for example, I don't think animals have any moral worth. That doesn't mean I get to treat them however I like. I treat them in a certain way because I recognize that part of my humanity means extending that humanity to animals and other things which I might not attribute moral worth to. So. That means that we also have to make the very difficult call that, in fact, not only does a fetus not have any moral worth, but also someone in a persistent vegetative state doesn't have moral worth. So that doesn't mean we get to treat them in any way we want. It just means that they don't necessarily hold the same moral worth as another human being. Thank you very much. I was very interested to hear the, the panel discuss, um, and Anne Faraday's points in particular, talking about the acknowledgement that the, that the fetus um, is alive, it is human, even if that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to take the fetus's right to life over the, right, uh, over the rights of the mother. Um, does, uh, are there any other applicable rights that we can give to the, to the fetus to respect that status? Just to give an example, I remember a few years ago there was um, a doctor from uh, the United States that posited that um, unborn children down to, I, th I think, about sort of 18, 20 weeks um, could potentially feel pain. Um, even if we're not going to do anything about abortion laws, um, would you be in support of um, laws which, a law, for example, which would require um, uh, pain relief to be given to the fetus before, um, before giving an abortion? I want to propose something a little different, a variation on what we've uh, heard in the first question. You know, Anne used a word in her, her last remarks, uh, intrinsic. Is there any mileage in making a distinction between an intrinsic and an extrinsic moral status? 
and saying that something with an intrinsic moral status, uh, a, a person with an intrinsic moral status, can formulate and pursue their own interests. And that's what makes their moral status intrinsic to them. They can sustain it. And that other beings may have an extrinsic moral status, in which case the difference between uh, an embryo and someone in a persistent vegetative state would be perhaps that an embryo is, is something to which uh, uh, the mother is able to invest or not invest uh, moral status and invite or not invite others to do likewise, whereas a very civilised convention is that people in general uh, invest a moral status in a person in a persistent vegetative state and is not simply uh, the overriding business of one person, the mother. Can we distinguish between those two types of moral status as another way of solving this moral problem? Listening to you, I don't think it's really... I might be getting this wrong, of course, but I don't think it's about the fetus. It's about you, isn't it? It, it seems to be that you, your uh, collective ability to work this question out gives you a, a moral sophistication, authority, and I'm assuming, Anne, that your, more, your view on this is more nuanced, perhaps as you get more experience, um, you know, in, in being in BPAS. But then, are you, you know, if you had the choice, would you redraft the law? You know, would you all sit together, work things out in the way that this is coming across, actually, you know, it's, it's tremendous? Or are you saying that outside of this room, this just doesn't happen, and that there isn't a chance for these discussions to be had, and therefore the average person looking for, I, you know, you want them to have autonomy, but you also, I assume, want the right to give advice based on your own authority. So it, how does that translate down to the person that wants that advice? You know, or are you just another kind of mini ethics committee getting in the way of things? You know, so it's that sort of something about what you're, you're part of a, a tradition, aren't you, in a way? You're, being, you're, you're either constructing or reconstructing a tradition of something which is actually very good, but I'm just wondering how that plays out in, in practice. I'm curious about what other decision you would be willing to make about a, a for and on behalf of a class of adult people who are completely sentient, completely able to make their own decisions. What other class of decision would you choose to make on their behalf? On the point about uh, moral status, I know this is something that cropped up in, in um, in Peter's talk as well about, you know, if one says that um, the acquisition of um, um, consciousness uh, uh, brings with it a, a higher level of um, moral status, uh, does that then imply that just as um, embryos before they um, develop consciousness can be killed, so humans in persistent vegetative states, for example, can be killed? I mean, uh, I guess what they've got in common is that they both uh, lack uh, consciousness. But I suppose on the side of the embryo, one can say, well, the embryo has got the potential to, to develop um, consciousness. The patient in PVS, you know, has, you know, if we understand, if I understand that uh, condition properly, hasn't got the potential to develop uh, consciousness. They've lost that irre irreversibly. But also there seems, so that's a relevant point, but all, you know, to, to, to call into question the comparison. But also um, the, the person in PVS... You know, if, if you take a very, very well-known case like Tony Bland, um, who's, you know, the, 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 to, to compare Tony Bland to, a case, to, to a, a, an early embryo, the, it just doesn't seem a fair comparison because by then, you know, Bland has got uh, networks of uh, friends, relatives, relations. So, to, it, it, again, it seems to me one is not comparing like with like if one starts to extrapolate from the, the properties that, that an embryo possesses or lacks to properties which people at the other end of life possess or lack. So that's, I know that, 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 that the remark is prompted by a, a, a response that, that David made, I, I think, to Anne, but also to a general concern about that, that kind of move, which is a very common move in the debate. Well, if we think this about embryos, therefore we must think this about patients with dementia or patients with PVS. But I think that's too quick because there are so many important differences between embryos and patients with dementia and patients in uh, PVS. I, I have to say, I don't like talking about the rights of embryos or the rights of, of fetuses because, or in, in any sense whatsoever, because I think it, it really does raise a lot of questions about what you mean by, you know, the, right, the rights of something or the right to do anything. And it seems to me that the problem with embryos and fetuses is that what you've got is something that is just utterly dependent on what other people do to it. And you can say that we might have certain responsibilities to treat 
certain things in particular ways that society sets out for us. But I think that's different from saying that those things have a right themselves. Sandy Starr, who I think has been doing a lot of convening on this, on the intrinsic and ethical moral status, Sandy, you're just way cleverer than me. And that sounds to me like it's a really good way of formulating it. So I'm quite happy to say that I think that's an idea that we should definitely have a think about. It sounds as though it makes quite a lot of sense. We'd want to think about that, and thanks for that. I I do think there is something to be said, the comments at the back about... um, about not only thinking about whether things have a moral status, but also to be thinking about what is dehumanising and dehumanising activity, coarsening activity. Because I honestly cannot think of anything that is more dehumanising than to be saying to somebody who is pregnant, I don't care what you think or you don't think about the moral status of your condition or your fetus, or your embryo, because I am going to take away your ability to make any decisions about whether or not you are going to become a mother or whether you are going to bring a child into the world. I mean, you you think of what it would feel like to be someone who was in a position where someone who was telling you that. And I think that is about the most dehumanising thing that you could possibly do to anyone, actually. So I do think that there is a real issue about humanity and what we think humanity is that's at the centre of this. I would love to think that there was a way of making these various viewpoints that we have not so incommensurate, which is precisely why I actually brought up a human rights legislation. What I'm actually calling everyone to is a basic kind of humanism. What I'm actually trying to say is that there is something unique about the human being that we should afford the basic right to life to all human beings, all members of the species Homo sapiens sapiens, if only because that is the surest way of guaranteeing that no one will be dehumanised, as I believe the unborn child is, and others like him or her. Um, I I don't think it's good enough to say, well, uh, the persistent vegetative state guy has relationships, people who care about him, or to say that, well, you know, adults have the ability to make moral choices. You're begging the question. You have to give me a reason why that should make any difference to moral status. I'm saying moral status should depend on one thing and one thing only, that you are a member of the human race. That, to me, is a consistent humanism we can apply across the board. Um, So I don't... That's why I wouldn't go with the intrinsic versus extrinsic moral status thing, uh, Sandy. Um, That, that to me, is very basic and very important. I'm just trying to think of anything else. But there is one way we could have some dialogue. Uh, The gentleman up there asked whether we could get together and and rethink legislation. Well, actually, I I did try to um, argue that on the basis of the current social dispensation, as much as I disagree with it, and you know, even and I would disagree with the current legal dispensation as much as I would as well, I think we can at least agree that if you're going to have this choice, then you should have that choice. In, again, a consistency with regards to applying choice. Women should have the choice to choose their providers of pre-abortion counselling, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, so I think we can agree on that. There can be consistency there. But what the problem with this whole debate, and I didn't realise this debate was going to turn into a whole debate over abortion per se, but the problem <laughs> with the abortion debate is that we bring so many presuppositions to the table that what we need to do is divvy those out, discuss them, and then come back to it. So we need to discuss, okay, why do we even believe in human rights? Why do we even believe in that there should be a moral status at all? On what basis do we say these things? And, obvi- and the problem with my position is that as a pro-lifer, I might have a very different view um, as to why I believe in human rights than other pro-lifers. They might have different reasons why they believe that, but what we share in common is a conviction that every human being has those inalienable human rights. So it's so complicated, and this is why this discussion is, is going to become problematic already. Could I just um, indicate, if there's any lawyers in the audience, I personally would be very interested in um, this question of rights and human rights in relation to abortion, because it does seem that somewhere along the line everyone stopped talking about rights, as in the right to autonomy and making decisions, and now... The discussion you always hear, and again, both sides are equally culpable, is about you know, human rights. You just end up in this kind of what always seems to me to be a circle, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the right to health, you know, from the pro-choice side, the right to life from the pro-life side, you know, and it just kind of goes round and round and round. Mm-hmm. So I'd That's be true. quite interested in some kind of discussion about, you know, why didn't we get <laughs> away from actual rights to a discussion about human rights? And, you know, is there any way of getting back? 
Um, Sarah. Uh, just to follow up on that point, actually, um, human rights as they are expressed in the Convention and in various articles of law are essentially legal rights. And I think where we, often get, where we often get mixed up is that we don't distinguish very well either in our language or our thinking between a legal right, a political right and a moral right. And I think what we are talking about most of the time, unless we're lawyers, I don't know, some of you may be, but what we're talking about most of the time in the abortion debate, when we say right, we really mean a moral rather than legal right. If you're a bit of an idealist like me, you think the legal is should represent the moral ought, and we know often it doesn't, and that's a point, that's a point <laughs> we'll come to. But I think, would, would a better way of looking at it, because I think we do get confused with this rights talk, instead of asking what do embryos and humans and um, humans in PBS have a right to, instead ask what's, what's good for these creatures, what's in their interests. So this is an alternative way of looking at it that I think explains both why we might say that we have we persons have an interest in continued life we might also be able to say that animals and fetuses have an interest in not being made to feel pain because they can suffer and yes i would i would support um moves to say if the fetus is capable of feeling pain then it should be um anesthetized before any sort of pain otherwise painful procedure would be performed so for these creatures who can feel pain, who can suffer, it's clearly whether or not they have a right not to suffer, legal, moral or whatever, we can clearly say it's against their interests to be made to feel pain. What we can't say is that it's against their interests to be painlessly killed because if they are not aware that they have a life, if a life is not something which has meaning to them, not something with which they are concerned, how can you say that you have an interest in continued life when you are not aware that you're alive? And I think that, to me, is, is the key distinction. I think the gentleman up the back and, um, and Sandy as well with the point about intrinsic versus extrinsic value and the reasons that we shouldn't simply do what we like with creatures that we might say do not have moral status. Um, I, I think that that relates actually quite well to it. So some of the reasons not to do what we like with creatures we might deem to be non-persons, in other words, creatures who don't have an interest in continued life and who we can wrong by killing, might be that they can feel pain, might be that they are of value to others. Just because I believe that there's no intrinsic wrong in terminating the life of a human before birth doesn't mean that I think it's always right. I mean, to perform an unwilling abortion on a woman who wants her baby is at the most, you know, a terrible moral crime as well as a, a legal one. But, um, you know, I think that um, this, this idea about rights, as, as you say, Jenny, confuses us more than, um, more than it helps us some of the time. I wanted to pick up also on um, the comment that was made about revising the law and are we, <laughs> are we yet another ethics committee? I think it, it picks up very clearly that what we're talking about here actually in terms of both today's public debate and the debate in the public sphere more generally, it isn't just a matter of our own moral opinions. So we all have our own opinions, so do you. I wouldn't necessarily claim that mine are any more nuanced or any better than yours. But what we're really talking about is how do we make policy in an area of ongoing moral disagreement? I think the current law is a compromise, not in the sense that people sat around and said this is something we could all sign up to, but it's a sort of unhappy compromise in the sense that nobody thinks it's morally consistent. Um, no, <laughs> not very many people are that, are that happy with it. Um, but I think it's also probably fair to say that whether you are, um, I hesitate to use pro-choice and pro-life because I think they, they cast the two sides unfairly, but whether you think that women should have more liberal access to abortion or that it should be outlawed completely, I think both sides are a little bit wary of reopening a, the debate in a legislative sense. Mm. And in fact, even despite the debate over the reduction in time limit that's been going on in the media, it, they've been quite clear to say, well, but we're not planning legislative change, um, at least to begin with. Um, because I think it could, it could really go either way. It's such an issue on which people have strong feelings. We might either wind up with a law in which abortion is available without the need to sign off harm to women's physical and mental health. That would be more a case of abortion at will. Um, or we could wind up with a case where the time limit goes down radically and women's access to reproductive health services is drastically restricted. And I think both of those are situations that enough people would not want to see that reopening the legislative debate is, is a very thorny question. Yeah. Just on that, I'm, I'm very glad you mentioned that because I think that's true. I think there is a sort of hedging around the kind of the, the legal debate. And I think what that indicates to me is that this isn't just a debate about the moral status of the fetus. It's also about something else. It's about 
the extent to which people are uh, trusted to make decisions about these very personal matters. Because, I mean, as you said, it would be morally wrong to perform an abortion on a woman who um, actually wanted to keep her pregnancy. I mean, that would be um, wrong from the, the, the standpoint of that relationship between the medical profession and the woman. But also, I think I would be wary of any um, law or policy that tried to enshrine a particular moral status to uh, you know, the embryo in law that basically said, you know, all women should have abortions, this is a simplistic view. All women should, should have abortions, all women shouldn't have abortions. Because that's not really the point, is it? There are always, presumably, going to be disagreements at a philosoph philosophical and ethical level about the moral status of the embryo or fetus. At a personal level, it very much depends on you. you know? and, and that, I think, is, is the basis of having a liberal abortion law, that um, you say to the woman, right, it is your decision not you should do this or you should do that, and you thus take into account um, the fact that she can feel about her embryo, you know, any way that she, any way that she likes. And so, yeah, well, what I do find interesting is that it, it does seem to me that a lot of the discussions that go on about um, the embryo now <coughs> sort of camouflage a kind of actually kind of deeper anxiety, which is about the extent to which we think people are cap capable of making those personal decisions for themselves and the extent to which we say, yes, we should have a hands-off law so people can make their choices. Um, firstly, about the uh, human rights conventions. They were framed against the backdrop of World War II, the Holocaust and the genocide, and without doubt the framers of those conventions, particularly the Universal Declaration, would have been horrified um, at the idea of abortion and other, thing, other than the most extreme circumstances. They saw eugenics and the disasters of the Holocaust and um, perhaps um, the framers um, attitudes towards human rights should be compared with Mary Stopes who wrote love letters to Hitler the second question was uh, my question really um, was about um, reopening the law now there's a huge amount of goodwill in this country towards um, disabled people following the Paralympics mm. uh, isn't it time that the concept of uh, a grave or serious handicap which is in the 1967 act Clearly that means something different in 2012 than it does from um, 1967. <laughs> and isn't it time also that the question as, as to what a serious handicap is left at the moment to the good faith of the mother and to the doctor, isn't it time that we reconsider that um, in the light of the, the Paralympics and our understanding of disabilities? I'm massively pro-choice um, and I have an issue with your argument, Sarah, and I think maybe to some extent Anne as well. I don't understand how the pro-choice lobby can make a convincing moral argument about the autonomy of a woman to make it, the auto autonomy of a woman in her ability to exercise choice when you keep framing the argument and are you so vehement about abortion being a matter of need and not a matter of want. And in my opinion, want is what, what is what we talk about when we talk about choice and when we talk about women's autonomy. To me, it sounds like you're only talking about autonomy for the woman who finds it difficult, who <laughs> finds it harder than shopping for a handbag, who finds it upsetting and problematic and does it because she needs to, not because she chose to, because she wants to. And I just want to say that I don't think that abortion has to be an inherently problematic, upsetting and difficult thing. It can be a difficult decision, but it isn't always. It can be unpleasant such as in late, in terms of the procedure, in terms of how late you wait to have an abortion, but it can also be pretty, un, pretty not unpleasant as well when you have an early term abortion, a matter of taking uh, pills and having an injection. Um, and it can be a, mat a matter of need for some women depending on their circumstances, but it isn't always a matter of need. David, you dedicated a lot of time uh, in your beginning speech to arguing that if women should have be fully informed enough to make a choice, but if you believe that, uh, you, you seem to think that if you give women all the information, they will inevitably choose not to have an abortion. Because Did you I said that, that that was the, the philosophy of one of these oh, right. Um, right. abortion thingies. So um, <laughs> if, if a woman with full information chose to have an abortion, do you accept that decision? Do I accept the decision to have an abortion? Obviously, for me, as a pro-lifer, abortion represents the decision to end another human life. So in that sense, I don't accept that it is ever right to do. Um, on the other hand, I don't judge individual women for having done it, for the simple reason that I don't judge anyone for making any... No, that's not true. I don't judge anyone for any, making any laws. <laughs> there are some moral decisions I do fully judge them for. Genocide would be one. Um, but I recognise that abortion is not as morally simplistic as genocide, um, say. Uh, just, there's, no, there's, no, there's no way to put this delicately, really, is there? Um, so, yeah, look, 
I, I, for me, I, I have no interest in judging individual women who have abortions, is the answer to your question. I do have an interest in saying, look, the nature of the act itself is something which I think contravenes the basic human rights of every human being, and that's the reason why I have the position I have. The reason I mentioned life uh, was simply to say, the, you know, life has non-directional counselling. It's not there to simply just say to women, right, here's all the reasons why you should have an abortion. But he, actually, even if it were, um, if a woman wanted that, why the hell not? I mean, it's her decision, surely. I, what I'm saying is, if you're going to frame the whole discussion around choice, and if we're going to accept that social uh, consensus, which I don't, incidentally, but if we are, just for the sake of argument, if you're going to be pro-choice, be consistent about it. That's all I'm saying. Just on the subject of autonomy, um, one thing that has always struck me about this argument that I've been looking at relatively recently is that nobody seems to take into consideration what responsibility the woman has in ensuring that she doesn't get pregnant. I mean, we are mostly adults in this room. I'm sure we all know how you do and don't get pregnant. It is one of the side effects or a potential side effect or byproduct, the same as if I cross the street and there's a car coming and I get run over. Similarly, it's a risk that you have to, that you have to take. Um, I'm undecided about whether or not I sit on the pro-life or pro-choice bench at the moment about it, but I am of the opinion that if I do something that results in something else happening, then that was you know, a conscious decision that I took. Mm. So I'd be interested to see what other people think about that. Very good point. I mean, it seems to me that this discussion has confirmed my view that this discussion will run and run and run, simply because there are very powerful arguments on both sides. And how do we unpick this? The whole debate is strewn, not here, but generally in, in, in the media, strewn with um, subplots and red herrings that uh, arise up all the time. But here's one we have narrowing it down. I mean, Anne says uh, rightly that it's not simply a matter, I mean, you imply in what you said earlier on, uh, having an abortion is not just a straightforward matter like having a tooth out because there is a reason for giving some sort of moral consideration, some sort of consideration to the emerging life. You say you imply it's a potential human being. I think it's an actual human being with potential, but it doesn't matter. I mean, there is an entity which, as you say, has a beating heart, um, at least after a certain stage, is human and is alive. Um, and then, uh, but the Sarah, in your, earlier in, in your first remarks, you said you implicitly construed the issue of the morality of abortion as being the issue of whether the fetus is wronged. That's the word you used. And that could lend to itself to an interpretation that you actually you do see this issue in terms of rights. And that's the most natural way to understand the concept of being wronged, to have your right violated. Mm. Now, okay, if we then think of it, ask ourselves, is this about rights or is it about interests? We've got a prima facie interest that Anne's admitted, which is here we have a living, a living being, a living human being, mm. which you, you could argue, plausibly, has some sort of interest in not being killed, even though it's not aware of that interest because it doesn't have a cerebral cortex mm. any more than a neonate does, or indeed a one-year-old, for that matter. So there's an interest there. So there is a, a reason for not killing this entity. Grant also that abortion, whatever you say about it morally, is descriptively deliberate killing. I mean, just, just, just descriptively. I mean, you don't need to. I mean, as is killing in war, which most people would agree is, you know, it's, it's justified in some circumstances. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got, now we, we have a pro-choice point emerging here, which is quite powerful. Um, stopping a woman from exercising her bodily autonomy is actually to violate her right, because there is a very, very powerful reason to think a woman has a right to make a choice about what happens to her body, which includes... Uh, a choice about whether another living entity is to be allowed to live off it. Okay, so that is a powerful right a woman might be said to have, you know, not to be forced to give birth against her will. Okay, now you can say, okay, rights are trumps. Rights are what matter here. So the woman's right to choose is now more important than the fetus's interest in staying alive. Okay, that's debatable, but let's suppose that's the case. Now we have the further question, are we always morally justified in exercising our rights? I mean, supposing somebody's starving outside my house and I have an abundance of food in my house, it's my food, I don't have to give them that person, I certainly couldn't be prosecuted for letting him starve, so I say, no, it's not my business, I mean, I can let him starve. We might think that's morally shoddy, okay, even if it's not strictly the violation of a right. So now the question is, well, first of all, it suggests that abortions may not have the same, I mean, not all abortions may have the same moral, moral status themselves. I mean, some abortions may be more justified or at least... Uh, better or not as bad as others. But I think it really, uh, just to focus this, I mean, I don't know what to think about it really because of these complications. Is it really about rights? Is it about interests, given that both do seem to be implicated in the debate? I think that uh, the point that Sarah made is, you know, about being morally wrong is a very rich way of explaining uh, the problem, which is, if you take to the logic of that, 
it, it could go as far as I would say it uh, in terms of denying the fact that we are talking about a moral status in any kind of meaningful sense. Because when you talk about the incapability of something being morally wronged, what you're really referring, referring to is that we're not talking about moral agents uh, that are in any, any sense uh, have the capacity to know right from wrong, uh, the capacity to speak the language or to experience uh, sort of uh, the imagination that's associated with kind of morality. And it seems to me that uh, there's is, that, that is a key point that throughout the human uh, history, people have <laughs> learned in different ways. We've learned, for example, to make a distinction between a person and a human. And personhood is not something that is a biological fact. It's not something that comes about through some kind of physical uh, sort of evolution. We make distinctions between the brain and the mind. You know, we, we don't, I, I've not yet heard uh, anybody argue that embryos and fetuses have got a mind, you know, sort of in, in any kind of, uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of serious sense. I, I do think that we need to uh, sort of come back on that because at the end of the day, the, the, the issue at stake is not right, uh, not rights, but what is right and what is wrong. It is, it is the capacity of making a moral judgment. And I think it's quite important that the pro-choice movement, you know, sort of occupies the terrain of, of morality particularly occupies the moral high ground, rather than allow other people to make that kind of a claim, because the language of rights actually denudes this, what is a very rich discussion of any moral content. It kind of narrows it down to a very philistine sense of competitive claims making as to who is more important, what, it, what is more important. Whereas I think what's this, the issue at stake here is the fact that uh, we don't simply diminish the, the meaning of morality uh, in the way that you know, everything becomes moral, every, ev every kind of cell, every kind of genetic material is kind of perceived in that kind of a way. And indeed, you know, when we talk about the interests of an embryo or a fetus, it's an interest that, that we as moral agents can uh, attribute and make decisions about. It's not an interest that the fetus or the embryo actually experiences. In other words, you, know, you, you don't have a little embryo saying, please don't do this to me, you know, sort of, because it's not in my interest. It's something that we imaginatively project onto that. So I, I do think that, I mean, I wouldn't even go as far as some people on the panel of saying that this has got a moral status. I think it's something that's morally, we, we feel strongly about, in the way that we have moral, a moral imagination towards animals, towards the planet, towards anything. We, we make morally responsible decisions, but not because the uh, objects of our decisions are necessarily moral agents or have moral status. Yeah, well, it, it really follows on from that because um, this is an attempt to try and define human beings based on a sort of bric-a-brac of um, sensations, emotions, reactions, and it never quite works because all you get from that is just, at best, one thing after another. And at worst, actually, you get everything at once because mm -hmm. there's no conceptual basis within the fetus in order to divvy out experiences. So you just get everything, and you can't experience everything at once, so it actually experiences nothing at all. Now, you might say, well, then, in that case, same goes for the neonate, you know, the newborn infant. And you're absolutely right. The same does go for the newborn infant. But the difference is, is that the newborn infant is born. And that's the moral difference. You know, the, the unborn infant is not born. It's, it's still inside the woman. It's still a part of her physiology. It's still a part of her body. And I think we do actually have to be a bit hard-nosed about that and say, look, if we accept the principle of abortion being right, and, and we do, then, yeah, at 38 weeks, inside is morally different from outside. And inside, you can abort, and outside, you can't. And that's, that's the difference, you know, and it's, you have to be just hard-nosed about that. Just very quickly, Anna, on the, the, this point you made about, you know, organ transplantation. Actually, what, what's really interesting is that in the fetus, because it hasn't gone through this process that's going to make it a conscious agent, it really doesn't matter what the fetus does. It can do anything it anything at all, spontaneous movements, reactions, whatever, and I have total confidence that it's completely unconscious, unaware, and it's not a person. Whereas for somebody who's seemingly dead, um, any reaction at all of any description should give us great pause um, that this person might actually still be a person. So there's a big difference transitioning into consciousness versus transitioning out of consciousness. My question is for Sarah. I think that we struggle with a picture of a couple coming into a clinic, a doctor's surgery, um, saying we've made, we've made our decision, um, we're having an abortion. I think that there is an image of um, 
I sort of feel that this sort of uh, discussion is sort of taking place not here, but somewhere like in the welcome collection with lots of kind of like fusty sort of um, images of sort of fetuses around. And although it's a very intelligent discussion, it's sort of what happens when the person is walking into the clinic? What is a kind of rational discussion that's taking place with doctor and patient in terms of the fact that there is um, different counselling available in terms of the future um, for this person who is pregnant. Um, what about the rights of the father? If we're talking about the rights of and um, discussing the rights of um, the fetus and when that begins, when do we actually start to have a discussion about the rights of the father and when does that take place? When does that start? Obviously, there's legal and um, this sort of medicalisation, if you like. I feel that the ethical discussion is sort of with sort of swaying between sort of um, medicalization on the one hand and human rights on the other. Um, the, the sort of rights of the father within this, um, for me, is someone that is unspoken that I think I'd like, um, you know, a little bit of answers on, um, if possible. My question is quite simple, really. Would you agree or disagree um, that there are impacts on the potential mother post-abortion? Um, and I'm interested in pro-life and pro-choice perspectives on that. To Peter, what about abortion in the case of rape? And to the rest of the panel, um, a fetus does have potential of consciousness. So does that potential mean that it has some degree of rights? Perhaps not full rights, but some kind of maybe some form of diminished rights, but rights nonetheless. Thank okay. you. If men could become pregnant and give birth, I think we would be able to have abortion as a sacrament. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, obviously I can't pick up on every point, although some extremely interesting ones. I would have definitely liked to pursue the autonomy line that why ask for any grounds? Why shouldn't uh, the, the, the choice of the mother be sufficient to justify uh, providing uh, an abortion? But I will just go um, to the point about disability. Although it's worth remembering only about 5% of abortions are on grounds of disability in the fetus. A troubling thing about that area of abortion is that, um, well, troubling to me anyway, is that abortion is permissible right up until the moment of birth if um, uh, uh, the disability is determined in the, in the, the fetus. And as the first questioner uh, hinted, it's uh, extremely widely open to interpretation how one uh, defines um, uh, severe disability. And the whole concept of disability itself is uh, an extremely controversial concept. You know, if one thinks that you know, someone like Oscar Pistorius is disabled and he's probably fitter than most of us in, in this room and certainly doesn't think of his, himself as uh, disabled. So uh, I, I think it would be worth uh, a, a return to that aspect of the law under which we can um, terminate fetuses on the grounds of having a severe disability in the fetus right up until the moment of birth. Uh, because of the, the complex nature of the concept of disability and diversity of understandings of that. Thank you, Stephen. OK, as, as Steve said, a, a lot of really rich points there, and I won't be able to address all of them. I will try and go, get to the ones that were specifically addressed to me. But I want to start with this point about the woman's responsibility. Um, I think if you believe abortion is wrong because the fetus has some kind of moral status, its moral status shouldn't depend on how it got there whether it got there as the result of an irresponsible one-night stand, as the result of, oh, I've, you know, now it's here but I've changed my mind, or, or as the result of rape. If it has some sort of moral status that means it's wrong to kill it, that moral status is independent of how that, how that feat has wound up there. If you think that abortion is all right because it's, the moral status of the fetus is not such that it would be wrong to kill it, then surely it's right no matter how responsible or irresponsibly the woman has behaved. Otherwise, I think, in effect, what you're saying is, well, you've been a little bit irresponsible. We're going to punish you for that by making you carry and bear a child that you didn't want. And I don't think that's a position that any of us would really defend. Um, so moral status shouldn't depend on how it got there. And I actually think, um, contrary to the gentleman in the front here, that moral status shouldn't really depend on location either. <coughs> Uh, I think it is possible to say that in a purely moral world, which we all know that this is not, in a purely moral world, the intrinsic moral status of a child in the womb at 38 weeks and the same child a few hours later outside the womb is in itself the same, but there are a whole host of other factors that justify treating it differently in practice, socially, and, and so forth. But one very important thing that the location does change is what competing interests there are. So not just whether that creature in itself has an interest in life. Um, oh, and on that point, I want to just pick up on this idea that, well, all life has an interest in life. 
I don't think we can validly claim that all life has an interest in life. Plants and bacteria and earthworms, I wouldn't say have an interest in life. Or if they do have an interest, it's such a minimal interest that the willed decision about the life course of an autonomous individual should always take precedence. So I hope that that clears that up a little bit. Let me get to the, the points that I wanted to address that were specifically directed to me. So one point was about oh, the rights of the father. That ties in with what I was just saying about the competing interests. Obviously, the, the rights or the interests or whatever we want to call them of the father should take effect at some point, and that point is when the object of concern is on neutral ground, i.e. outside the woman's body, because I think up till that point, the interests of the woman in what happens to her body are always going to be far stronger. As far as the point about need not want and should it always be difficult, no, I, I am, um, I'm sorry if it came across that way. In any case, I think what we, what we, are, what we are both saying there is not that only women who need one because of social circumstances versus want one because of life choices should be given one. Not that at all. The point about need versus want is a woman who is pregnant and doesn't want to have a child needs an abortion. I don't think anybody... I might be wrong about this. I don't think anybody goes out one day and says, I want to have an abortion, let's go get pregnant so I can have abortion, an abortion. That's the kind of need versus want that we meant. It shouldn't always be difficult. Thank you. I said at the beginning, I don't think we can make a, a reasonable distinction uh, between the... Uh, well, we can make a distinction, but not a separation a dichotomy between the moral and the medical. I, for the same reason, I don't think we can make a meaningful distinction between the moral and the political. Uh, to say uh, we should talk about right and wrong rather than rights, to me, seems completely confused. We talk about rights precisely because we have an account of the moral status of the human being. Um, it is based in morality. You're having a moral discussion, and then you're applying that positivistically to law, to politics. So I, I don't see how that makes any sense whatsoever. I, I think that Frank uh, Frady and the gentleman down here beg the question when, we talk, when they talk about you know, whether or not a, a, a human being is a moral agent or whether it has a conceptual basis. So what? what? Why do you bring that up? I mean, you're begging the question. You have to establish to me and give an argument as to why that should be at all relevant as to whether or not we, that we uh, give a moral status to a human being. I don't really see that that argument has been given yet. Ultimately, I do believe in natural rights. I do believe that every human being has that right. And I agree with Sarah completely that regardless of how um, a human being has been conceived, they have that moral status. That does mean, of course, that in the tragedy of rape, it is not justifiable then to commit the murder of a human being to assuage the, the, the terrible damage that's been done on the woman who has been in, in that rape. It's a terrible situation. Life is that bad and imperfect sometimes. But that, I think, we're going to be consistent. We're going to have consistent humanism, as I've consistently asked, uh, aunt, argued for, that we need to have a consistent view of human rights applied to all human beings that allow for the protection of everyone, regardless of how vulnerable they are, disabled, or whatever. Thank you, Vita. And Anne. Okay, I just want to really address two points. One, the one about serious abnormality and abortion for that. I, I just don't know what the Paralympics taught people. You know, I mean, what on earth did the Paralympics teach people? We knew that people with disabilities were capable of extraordinary effort to overcome them and do wonderful things. It hasn't taught us anything at all about disability. And I cannot imagine two better people to determine... Uh, the way that whether or not uh, the way that a fetus is affected by an abnormality than a woman and, and her doctor. I can't imagine what any committee could add to that. And I think that it's absolutely the right people to be making a, a decision about abortion in those circumstances. On um, the issue about choice and need, I, I, I do think that this is an interesting one. And I just want to end really by saying what I think we mean when we talk about choice in these circumstances. <laughs> The quote that was used down here that's often a contested one is that no woman chooses to have an abortion like she chooses a handbag or a new pair of shoes. She chooses to have an abortion like an animal in a trap chooses to gnaw its leg off. And I think that there is some truth in that point. I think it speaks to what I was saying at the beginning that abortion as a right isn't exercised in the way that you exercise the right to vote. A woman has an abortion, not because she's pro-choice or she's anti-choice, but because she has a particular need in relation to her unwanted pregnancy. But, and this is a crucial point, she's then in a position where she is able to make a decision. She makes a choice about how she is going to resolve the outcome of that particular decision. And that, to me, is the most important thing, that she is in a quandary. She's in a difficult situation, but she has the ability to make that decision by herself. That's an important aspect of being human. Now, Frank talks in his talk a couple of minutes ago about um, Sartre 
and existentialism? Well, I want to refer to a much more popular existentialist in finishing this. How many of you have either read or watched Game of Thrones? Hands up. Come on. Admit it. Okay, right. Well, I'm going to refer to that well-known existentialist Tyrion Lannister in Game of Thrones who makes the point that no one is a slave except by choice. <laughs> it may be a choice between slavery and death, but there's a choice nevertheless. And he's making the point that that is a really core thing that he's valuing in a situation where he is going to be a slave, which I won't explain further to you for those of you who haven't got to those bit of the books. But you kind of realise that even if you are deeply in the shit, you should have the ability to make a decision about the circumstances that you are in. So same point really. Humanity is about having the decision about how your future will be shaped. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I'd like to thank the speakers. Also thank uh, Sandy Starr at the back for putting together this excellent session.